Já jsem, pane eurokomisaři, velmi rád, že jste si našel cestu ve svém programu na sociálně demokratické fórum a sociálně demokratickou půdu tady v České republice. <laughs> And I apologize for it, it's channel two. <laughs> so the English language is on the channel two. <laughs> If, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's functioning, great. So, uh, Děkuji ještě jednou, že jste si našel cestu na sociálně demokratickou půdu tady v České republice, na konferenci Call to Europe, fórum, místo, které společně dali dohromady nadace pro evropská progresivní studia, FEPS a Láslo Andor se svým týmem, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Pražská kanceláří, ředitel Urban Ibršer se svým týmem, Lubomír Zaorálek a Masarykova demokratická akademie jako Česká politická nadace sociální demokracie. Já vám dám slovo k vašemu úvodnímu vystoupení. Domluvili jsme se, že potom bude prostor na několik málo otázek. Naším hostem a řečníkem je Nikolas Schmidt, mimo jiné dvojnásobný ministr práce, ale nyní Evropský komisař pro práci a sociální práva. Pane eurokomisaři, máte slovo. So, good evening, uh, all dear friends. Yes, dear comrades. So it's a, first, it's a great pleasure to be in Prague. It's always a pleasure to be in Prague, I must say, especially uh, now uh, with this very special atmosphere. And uh, I, uh, I want to thank uh, Paps and especially Laszlo for inviting me. And uh, I think it's a very important idea, a very good idea to organize this kind of meetings because uh, what we need now Uh, among all the progressives and our social democratic family is uh, really a strong reflection on what is going on in our societies, but also what is going on in the world. Because a lot of what we believed yesterday might not be true anymore today. And therefore, I think it's up to our family, to the social democrats, to the progressives all over Europe, but also in cooperation with other progressives around the world, to develop new thinking in order to also influence our political action. And uh, obviously, this uh, political action is extremely important because uh, we know that a lot of uh, people around the world, and especially also in Europe, in all member states, people are suffering. This is a new fact. And I think you have centered your debates on uh, the price increases, which mean for many families, for many people, but also, by the way, for many small and medium-sized enterprises. So indirectly also for jobs, a major, major challenge. So, what can Europe do? What can we do inside Europe? And what has been done also during the last uh, month? First, I would say, we, uh, when this commission took over in uh, 2019, late uh, 2019, we had one big idea in mind. And it was climate change. It was the idea that we had as Europeans respond to a major challenge, representing a real threat for the planet and so for decent living on our planet. Uh, we had to really uh, respond to the challenge of climate change. And so we started working on that. But at the same time, we were aware that having such a transformation to mitigate climate change and to put Europe in the lead of those responding to climate change, we should absolutely take on board not only the economic constraints, but especially, and so, and especially the social aspects. So for us, it was very clear that this transformation of our economies and in some way the transformation of our societies linked to the Green Deal, linked to the response 
to climate change, it was absolutely indispensable to have it fair and socially just. And that's why from the beginning on, our family, the Social Democrats in the European Parliament, they asked for a strengthening of the, um, a strengthening of the social dimension of Europe. I think you had a debate on uh, Laszlo's book on social integration, and I read your book, and it's a very uh, interesting uh, and very uh, important book because it, it gives us the view how uh, difficult it was in some way to build a social Europe. And I must say, uh, Laszlo, you, you were a commissioner some time ago. You were a commissioner in a quite difficult circumstances and environment after the big, and it was not really after, it was still partly in during the big crisis, financial and economic crisis. And nevertheless, you managed uh, to put some important measures and, uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the agenda, like uh, I remember very well the youth guarantee when we worked on the youth guarantee. You uh, pushed for the uh, social investment package, and I think this social investment package is more important and more um, decisive as ever, uh, than ever, and a few other measures. Uh, so uh, you pushed and you gave us some tools which are still important for the action today. But as I said, when we started, it was climate change. But a few months after, it became COVID. So we, f we were facing one crisis we never had experienced in Europe before, or at least a long time before. And COVID crisis was a real challenge for European, for not only for the Commission, it was a challenge for the European Union because we saw at one moment when a, a certain number of acquis, like free movement, were put into question very concretely when borders closed again. But not only that, when uh, also the solidarity between member states was put into uh, jeopardy. And uh, that's why uh, finally the reaction of Europe at that moment was a decisive one because it was the choice not only of managing together the pandemic through among others, the issue of vaccines, but also to put into place a very ambitious program, the Next Generation EU, helping to prevent the fragmentation, the fragmentation of Europe, because that's one of the major threats for Europe is the fragmentation. Not only the fragmentation, by the way, of the internal market. We always hear where it's a fragmentation of the internal market, but it's also the fragmentation of the social context of the social environment, the social fragmentation, which represents also a real threat uh, for Europe. And when we thought that we had the COVID more or less behind, because COVID is not entirely over, well, then started this terrible war in Ukraine, this aggression of Russia against Ukraine, this criminal war, uh, which uh, finally broke with some ideas we had on international cooperation, on international values, on the respect of international uh, law. And this was uh, really and is still uh, also something which uh, has to be integrated absolutely in our new thinking. Uh, and I would say it's the three things, the three crises, Climate change, a major challenge to change a lot of things in our societies. COVID showing that, uh, well, we have other threats like pandemics and we need the right responses against these threats like, for instance, investing a lot in social, investing a lot in health. And then uh, the breaking down of uh, an international order the uh, questioning of international law, which brought together, and it had already started with uh, COVID, 
not only the normal globalization, because we for long thought that globalization was definitely established and it was finally a win-win. Now uh, we know that globalization was never really a win-win. There were always losers in the globalization, always, and they have not been so much compensated. And now the value chains on which we have had based a lot of our economies by delocalizing a lot of activities somewhere just by looking at the cost factor, and especially the labor cost factor, that this was not any more functioning. You know, I was this, after, this morning with uh, Skoda, and they explained to me, well, you see these marvelous chains of production. They are just stopped because we do not get any semiconductors that are produced somewhere in Asia. And the value chains are interrupted, or there is some obscure speculation on uh, semiconductors as there is speculation on energy and so on, and the value chains do not function as we had a bit naively expected they should always uh, 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 function. So I think these are the big challenges we have to work on. And this means that we have in some way rebuilt a lot of things in Europe, rebuilt not only our economy to make it more sustainable, to make it climate neutral, that's the Green Deal, reducing actively and rapidly the emission, which needs a lot of transformation in our economy, but also uh, building our social infrastructures and services. Uh, because we, we learned that without good hospitals, uh, without strong medical services, our society can be under heavy threats, under heavy dif in, uh, in di uh, uh, big difficulties like the pandemic, and then showing that finally delocalizing everything outside of Europe was not only weakening us, but uh, even threatening in some way our economic model. And that's, I think, uh, uh, the three uh, elements which are important uh, in, uh, in the politics which... Uh, which we have now to uh, develop, also as uh, progressives and social, Democrat, uh, social democrats. Now, what has been done in the meantime? I have already uh, mentioned a few things which have been done. First, I, I would say uh, what we have done is, uh, I remember when uh, the president called me and said, well, we have to do something during the COVID crisis because we will have major unemployment problems. And uh, from one day to another, we were able to decide a mechanism called SURE, and that helped finally to save millions of jobs, but also millions of companies, especially small and medium-sized companies, because finally we uh, put it together 100 billion euros which help member states, especially those who are not as financially strong as others. And coming back to the idea of fragmentation, well, to finance short-time uh, labor systems. And this was a success. It was a success because we managed to react rapidly and uh, it helped us uh, to overcome major uh, questions of uh, 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 of jobs, and it helped us once the COVID crisis was more or less over, that the economy could restart. And we saw last year, especially, a very strong rebound of the European economy. And that is partially due also to the fact that we could keep people in their jobs, that we could maintain income more or less, and we could help companies just to restart because their stuff was at their disposal. So this is a very concrete measure, how Europe, in, by solidarity, by uh, finally putting at the disposal of member states 100 billion euros, could overcome uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, major uh, crisis we, we, uh, we went through during uh, COVID, uh, COVID, uh, COVID crisis. But now uh, we have another issue, which is, in my view, uh, perhaps more difficult than uh, the issue of uh, COVID. This is uh, the energy prices. And uh, here, 
I must say we have not yet come to the decisions which we uh, probably need. Because what we need now is uh, to limit also at the European level the impact of these energy prices increases on people, on households, on companies. Because what is at stake here is obviously first an increase of poverty all over Europe. Because as a, a trade unionist, you know that even if you increase the salaries, and uh, here is a country I, I learned this morning that you have a, uh, an inflation at this moment of 20%. And 20% is, is really high. And it's not easy for trade unions to ask an, an increase in salaries by 20%. So this, this is a major issue, how we can come back first, combat inflation, and inflation is surely an issue of energy prices, of a lot of other prices in the value chains, food is another element, but there is also an element there of those who I call the free riders of inflation. So who anyway, and anyway increase their prices because they see a good opportunity just to increase their prices because we are in an inflationary environment. So here also, perhaps we have to be a bit tougher to limit some price hikes and price uh, increases in a way to limit inflation. And I'm a bit skeptical that we can manage that only through monetary uh, policy. By the way, there is a debate now on the famous spiral prices and wages and saying, well, we have to be very cautious because uh, there is this, this uh, major issue of uh, uh, inflation being pushed further by too rapid and too massive uh, uh, wage increases uh, due to prices and prices uh, 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 rising because of too, too much uh, wage increases. Well, here I would say that, I would not say that this is impossible, but it is interesting to see that even the IMF, the IMF has now issued a very interesting study on that issue and saying, well, this is over, um, there, is, there is no signal now at this moment, especially in Europe, that we are in this kind of spiral because uh, there are different elements which show that inflation is not fostered by wage increases, and we see that wages are lagging behind still very much price increases. So there is not a, uh, there is not a situation of uh, this spiral which uh, uh, some argue to uh, convince well, unions not to be too, uh, uh, too uh, demanding. So I think this is important. We have to allow wages to not to be disconnected from prices. Because if we are doing that, that means that we will have not only an increase in poverty, that's obvious, and more and more, especially low income wages uh, to drop into uh, poor uh, labor or poor uh, working poor, but also to have a major impact, a recessionist impact on our economy. So I think this is a, an issue. I, I think we have to work with trade unions on this. And therefore, bargaining, collective bargaining now, we have to support trade unions on this collective bargaining. And that, that brings me to a, a directive which this commission adopted and which finally was adopted by the council and the parliament, which is now definitely adopted. And that's the minimum wage, uh, minimum wage uh, directive. Uh, if somebody had told me, uh, and probably, I don't know, uh, Laszlo, what do you, th what do you think? Uh, can we do something on minimum wages? It was certainly circulating the idea, but can we do something very substantial, important on minimum wages? I would have been very skeptical. And finally, we managed, and we managed it um, because I think there is an awareness now that during the last 20 years, something has gone in our economies which is not, which is 
not fair. And uh, we have seen wages decreasing permanently. And I remember the unions, the last election, European election, uh, campaigned for it's time for pay rise. And there was in, in some way a, 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 a gap, a, a, an increasing gap between uh, wages on one hand and other revenues and especially cap, capital revenues on the other. So this allowed us and this gap, I think everybody understood that there was something going on in the economy which was not fair and which not right, and even economically not sound. And therefore we managed to have this directive, which does not allow us to establish minimum wages, but at least to oblige member states to have a method to establish minimum wages uh, in conformity with a certain number of procedures and parameters. And I hope so that this is a good tool now and I would even plead that this should be applied now. We should not wait until two years' time the di directive is transposed. It should be applied now to look what our minimum wage is doing in the context of, uh, of uh, this crisis and this inflationary uh, tensions. But this directive is more just than uh, proposing uh, a system to establish minimum wages. This directive is in some way a breakthrough on pushing for not only more social dialogue, but especially for strengthening collective bargaining. Now, collective bargaining, everybody would say, well, that's normal, that's part of our social market economy. But when we look backwards to the crisis, you experienced one of the elements was that collective bargaining was questioned, was put into question. So it was not anymore considered as a fundamental element of our social market economy. It was in some way uh, uh, in Greece, but also all, in many other countries, in Spain, in Portugal, uh, considered well collective bargaining, if then it has to be on the level of companies and not of uh, sectors, it has to be limited, collective agreements were put into question, were uh, halted and so on. So I think to say now in a directive, the elements, the fundamental elements of collective uh, bargaining is, seems to me a very important uh, uh, part uh, of our social policy and therefore I think uh, we, uh, it's, it's absolutely important that we defend this, uh, 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 this uh, major uh, social uh, acquis and which uh, is uh, an essential part of, um, of um, our social, economic and social system. Without strong collective bargaining, there is no social market economy. This is clear, and that's something which has to be said. And I must say, this commission is defending the idea of social market economy, and therefore we defend it also a strengthening of collective bargaining. The third element I would uh, say a few words about is, well, we are in this Incre incredible transformation of our economies, taking place at the same moment of a major crisis. And uh, many sectors are affected by, the, by, by this crisis, but are, are also under heavy pressure to change, to transform, uh, to, uh, to go towards uh, a CO2 neutral um, uh, uh, industry or uh, activity. And this means for jobs a major issue because this means that uh, people I either have to change their jobs because we will lose jobs or their jobs will just change. So I'm, I'm not belonging to those saying, well, it will be a jobs crisis. I think we have the potential to make out of this transformation something which is creating jobs. Well, we are, uh, we are considering that uh, uh, if everything happens well, that's always the, the fundamental hypothesis of the scenario, uh, we will uh, create by 2035 or 40 about 2 million jobs. Okay, but we have to do something to, do, to achieve this goal. And what can we do? First, I think we have to invest more rapidly and much more in renewable energy. And here the Commission has proposed a, a, a plan, which we call Repower EU, to invest more and more rapidly. 
we have to accelerate to change uh, the energy paradigm uh, in Europe. Because our dependency on Russia is not an option anymore. Our dependency on fuel, fossil fuel fuels is not an option anymore. So I think what is now important is that we invest more in alternative energy sources. The second point of that is we have to give people the possibility to retrain, to be reskilled, to be upskilled. This happens in many sectors, be it automotive, be it energy, be it construction, be it all kinds of industries where we have to allow people to be skilled and reskilled. So I think the skilling revolution, it's now the moment to, to get it right. And therefore, by the way, we have announced that next year will be the European Year of Skills. And uh, just uh, perhaps tomorrow we will, with social partners, discuss this. I think the lifelong learning culture which is not so developed in this country because everybody says, well, the Czech Republic is a champion because you have the lowest unemployment rate in Europe, the lowest. This is not a guarantee, you know, because now changes are moving, changes uh, are affecting a lot of sectors. So I think the investment in human, uh, human capital is extremely important and therefore now we, uh, we have to promote a skilling revolution. We have to invest more in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, people's uh, skills. And we have to have a different approach to managing the labor market. Because for the time being, the idea was, well, people who lose their jobs first get unemployed. And then we, we see. I think what we have to do is we want a, a smooth and fair and just transition. We have also to apply a smooth and fair transition on the labor market. And we have really to make efforts if people have to change their job, be it inside a company or from one company, from one sector to another. We have to prepare better these transitions. And here the commission has made a certain number of proposals. How can we manage these transitions? And here skills are essential. They are of essence but especially they give also trust. Trust to people who know that maybe their job will be lost. I was in Slovakia uh, last week and we had a lot of discussion, especially in areas where people know that probably their job will be lost. But then you have, you cannot say, well, your job will be lost and then we see. No, we have to prepare differently this transition economically, industrially, but also what the labor market is concerned. So I think this is a new approach on the labor market on active employment policy, which guarantee better transition and give people trust. And by the way, also keep uh, regional and social cohesion together. My last uh, point is, well, what, what next? I think I haven't yet managed, uh, mentioned it. Uh, all this was inspired by an instrument which was uh, launched in 2017, so exactly five years ago, and which is the social pillar, or the pillar of social rights. I must confess that when it was launched, I was a bit skeptical. I said, well, nice principles, but it's a declaration. It's um, not legally binding. There is no real political program behind it. Now, with the Porto Summit, with an action plan, with a certain number of initiatives, we were able to launch, not only to launch, but also to achieve, like the minimum wage. There are others very important, like platform work. That's the digital side, I didn't mention so much, but the digital side, which is also a transformative uh, process for the, uh, uh, for the labor market. I think we, we have a, a very valid instrument, which we have to preserve for the future. This is the issue, because now we have made progress, but what happens next? What uh, is this dynamic, social dynamic continuing? This is the big challenge. And that's why, as social democrats, we have to explain that we have now, in some way, put social Europe on track. And it would be a catastrophe, a catastrophe, especially after the next European elections, if suddenly this dynamic was interrupted, stopped, or just slowed down. So I think the uh, social pillar has become a real tool. It has become a tool not only 
to uh, achieve things like a minimum wage, like a directive on platform. And really, this will be, is a hard discussion with platform. And there you discover the interest and the lobbies behind the platforms, the Ubers and others who are exerting a real pressure to try to amend, to weaken down, to, watering the, to water, water down the directive the Commission has proposed. So in the Parliament and especially also in the, in the Council. And I think this is now the big choice people have to, to be aware of. Uh, that, well, this social dynamic which has uh, developed on the basis of uh, the uh, social pillar can be stopped can be even be reverted. And I think this is uh, uh, very important to, uh, uh, to, to explain to, to our electorate, to our people uh, in, 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 this, in this very special and, uh, uh, context. And if the social pillar is so important, it's because it's not just social separate from all the rest. Social has to be part of the overall economic and financial and budgetary governance of the European Union. We do not want social to be just a corrective. We, are, we know perfectly well to have a strong, resilient economy, social has to be really part of that. And in the governance, and this is a fight now we had, also when we discussed a lot about uh, what kind of budgetary governance we, we will have. I'm not perfectly happy, but at least to know that the social criteria, the social scoreboard, you, uh, Laszlo, launched, which has been renewed, which has been reinforced, that this is part of the whole governance in Europe, the economic governance and social government, that they, they, they are very much interrelated. And um, they have to be interrelated because I think that, uh, as I said, the resilience of our societies are largely depending on it. But it's more than the resilience of our societies. At the end, it's also about democracy because we see that democracy is not something which is definitely achieved. We are under threat of populist movements who use the present crisis, who use the frustration of a lot of people because of inflation, because of unfairness in our society, because of precariousness. We have really to show that the only way to save our democracy is also to have so strong social systems. Otherwise, we are uh, uh, running a risk for our democracy because populism, well, are everywhere. There is no country in the European Union and outside, same thing, where populism is not trying to undermine our de democratic uh, systems. And added to that, the social dimension of Europe has, I would say, uh, even a geopolitical dimension. Because it is obvious that those who play on the weakness of Europe believe that they can, can undermine our solidarity. Solidarity between the member states, but also the solidarity inside our societies through this war, through the energy crisis, through this idea, well, sanctions are punishing yourself and not punishing the aggressor. And therefore, we have to make sure that during this period, we have the right tools in place now. Uh, and uh, I would quote Stiglitz, who said, well, we are, you, you are, we are in a war, and you cannot have an ec economy of peace during wartime. You have a, something like a war economy now, and war economy means also fairness, taking on board the situation of those who are suffering most, who are suffering especially uh, in the area of uh, their income and of their precariousness. And I think a uh, special thought uh, for the young, because uh, this is, uh, was already during the previous crisis uh, a, a special concern that we have to make sure that uh, the young generations are not the major losers, losers of this evolution. Now, I think this is about a call, uh, a call to Europe. A call to Europe that we need now strong social policies, that we need uh, fairness in this period of transition and in this period where we have to face 
a very exceptional and very unforeseen crisis, not only political, but also economic and uh, in some uh, way also social. Thank you. Zeptám se, kdo má otázky. Uh, tak Lubomír Zaorálek, Rufus Koftun, Josef Středula. That's a very, a very important question. I think convergence is more accessory than ever. It's about economic convergence, which is going on quite well in some aspects, not everywhere in the same way. And you mentioned also regional convergence because we always generalize. We see only members, but we also have to see regional convergence. I think this is a big issue about uh, uh, gaps. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. No, it it works. So the regional convergence is is, uh, and the regional convergence may be uh, in this part of Europe. It may be also in some other parts in Southern Europe or even Central Europe. So I think this is uh, extremely important. Now, without convergence, economic and social, we will have a fragmentation of Europe. And it is an illusion to think that we can be a strong Europe, even with a better defense capacity, uh, without having a strong convergence, convergence in economic and social terms. You will not have a strong political uh, Europe without economic and social convergence. So I think uh, we have to maintain this objective of cohesion. I think uh, uh, investing uh, in those countries to help them to uh, catch up. This is, remains an important element. The second one is important. Building con economic convergence without social convergence is an illusion. Well, there was this idea, well, the convergence will be automatic. And finally, we are now exploiting our differences in wages, for instance, and then uh, after some period, after some time, everything will converge. This did not happen. Really. So I think we also have now to push for social convergence because one issue which I didn't mention, but which is one issue I hear all the time now in Brussels, especially from friends from Central and Eastern Europe, is a demographic issue. The young people, the young people leaving, perhaps less in the Czech Republic, I think, but in other countries like Slovak, uh, Slovak Republic, but also Romania, Bulgaria, where it, it has become a dramatic situation. Uh, it's the demographic issue. If you are not closing the gaps, the social gaps, so pushing social convergence together with economic convergence, you're weakening all these countries because the best trained, the best uh, educated, the most motivated, they leave. The young generations leave because well, they do not see or they believe that there are better opportunities somewhere else. I'm not against free movement. I think free movement of, in Europe is, a, is an important element, but you cannot build a, a, a real strong Europe just by, by, uh, by encouraging people to move from one country uh, to another and, 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 and weakening finally the capacity of those countries existing uh, 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 being challenged by this free movement uh, and, and not knowing how they can develop. If you lose part of your young generation, well, there you, you have not the possibility to develop and this then will be a real bottleneck for the future, economic, social, but also in some way political because uh, if you lose uh, your youth, you know this has also some political consequences. Well, first, on, on, uh, on the different elements you mentioned, on a, a fiscal capacity, I think uh, w you cannot have a, a stable monetary union without also a fiscal capacity. I think this is, uh, we, we have created now a fiscal capacity without saying it, through the new generation EU, through the uh, re recovery and resilience plan. This is, in a way, a fiscal capacity which was created during the COVID crisis and which is now helping us to push for investment uh, in, in this difficult period. So, but uh, we have to have a permanent fiscal capacity. 
difficult to achieve because we had a long discussion on that during the uh, discussion on the re reform of the uh, e uh, euro governance, and it was not possible to come out with clear proposal on fiscal capacity. But the next crisis, we will experience the same need, and uh, we have to reinvent then during the crisis a new instrument. So fiscal capacity seems to me absolutely important. The second one is, 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 is about social convergence. And I think uh, I would not, if you call it social union or uh, we call it a union of social welfare states, all this is not important. What is important is that we have to close the gaps, the social gaps between member states, which does not mean that every member state has exactly to have the same social system. There might be still divergencies. When I had difficult discussions with our Nordic friends because they didn't like the minimum wage, for instance, because they said we need not know minimum wage because we have a very strong collective bargaining. I always told them nobody obliges you to adopt the minimum wage because everybody would be happy to have a collective bargaining system you have. So there, there will be di differentiation, but there has to be social convergence on the major issues on, on, on wages, on social protection. Therefore, we have made now a certain number of proposals like the minimum income. All member states have some sort of minimum income, but uh, with big differences. So we have to try to bring convergence in the different social systems uh, in, in order to avoid what I call the social fragmentation of Europe, which is as bad as the economic fragmentation. So I think the idea of a so strong social Europe, for all the reasons I mentioned, plus uh, probably some others, is extremely important to increase, and I fully agree with you, the uh, political legitimacy of Europe. Because Europe is also about values. You, and the social value, the value of a social system uh, is, is extremely important. And, and the weaknesses of Europe, by the way, we experience, especially, uh, and the populism, the rise of populism is because people said, well, Europe doesn't care about social values. It's about competitiveness, it's about the internal market, it's not about people. And the populists really use this, saying, well, that's the neoliberal, whatever, Europe, which doesn't care about your problem. And that's the danger now, and that's why social policy precisely at this juncture is so important. That's not populist, I think, not at all. I think this is our common aim, because uh, I think at the end, uh, the European Union uh, is running big risks if uh, finally people have the have the feeling, and not only the feeling, are facing a reality which shows that uh, uh, their uh, personal situation is worsening. Uh, you know, when, when we launched the action plan and before the summit, uh, the Porto summit, uh, we organized a poll, a poll on social Europe, because we always told, well, people do not want your social Europe. That's national competence. Leave social to the national sphere. That's what we hear. In many cases, in many, in Germany, by the way, it's the, the employers, less the government, or some parts of the government would say the same thing. In many areas, you, you hear. And then there was this poll, and what did the poll say? That over 80% of European citizens say, for me, social Europe is important personally. It's not an abstract. People understand, if we are not promoting social values, social protection systems at European level, like the minimum wage, like better directives for uh, protection of workers, health and safety, like uh, uh, also platforms, big issue. We will talk tomorrow about that. Uh, like also more rights of workers in companies. Now we are working on uh, reinforcing the European work, uh, working, uh, workers councils. Uh, who are not taken serious all the time, so uh, trying to, to, to strengthen a bit the workers' councils. All this, uh, people understand that if that, that doesn't happen at European level, it won't, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, not happen at national level. And we will put member states 
in competition to the lower standards at social level. That's what happens for taxation also. That's why I believe absolutely that we need a minimum standards in taxation. It, it's not possible that uh, uh, companies can find, even if it's, I know some countries who practice that also, uh, find ways uh, to, to minimize their tax bills. And therefore we need these standards and we need them also at the social level. But it is difficult because polit the political landscape is not always so easy. And I must say I was astonished when we got this qualified majority for the, for the, for the minimum wage. Now we, we have to get a, a, a good directive on platform. I, it's a fight, I can tell you. It's a fight. Uh, because member states know they, they want to have this uh, um, approach which uh, finally leaves uh, part of the uh, new economy, the gig economy, outside the social framework, which is absolutely unacceptable. So I think we, we have to fight together, uh, politic on the political level, together with the trade unions uh, and with those governments engaged in a more uh, positive uh, approach towards uh, social Europe, we have to fight together. And this is what I say, we have to make sure that after the next European election, we will not stop the dynamic which more or less has started now and in difficult circumstances.